Hello, and welcome to this video series covering Sitecore and Docker. My name is Rob Earlham and I'm a technical evangelist with Sitecore. And today we're going to take a look at the different entry points that are supplied with the Sitecore Docker Images repository. But first of all, what is an entry point? If you look at the Docker documentation, it tells you that an entry point allows you to configure a container that will also run as an executable. But what does that mean? Well, entry points provide a way for you to execute a command inside of a container. This could either be during the build process or at runtime. In this video, we're going to focus on the second usage, using an entry point to execute a script at runtime when the container first launches. In this case, it will involve executing a couple of specific PowerShell scripts depending on the scenario we're working with. The images created by the site called Docker Images Repository come with two different example entry points that you can use out of the box. The first one is for production workloads and provides functionality to improve logging and monitoring. The second one is for local development workloads and gives you the functionality provided by the production scripts, but also has extra functionality for debugging and deployment type scenarios. The first thing we add in for the production endpoint is we install the IIS Service Monitor. This is a Windows executable specifically designed to be used when running IIS sites inside of a Windows Server container. The Service Monitor monitors the status of the IIS service, and it ties this status to the actual status of the container. This means that if the IIS service within the container terminates or exits in any way, the container itself will exit as well. That means when you look at this container externally, it becomes much clearer whether it's in a healthy state or not. The next key feature in the production entry point is around how logging is handled inside the container. When you work with a locally installed Sitecore instance, the logs are written directly to disk and they're really easy to access. The same as with the rest of your logs, things like IAS, they're again written directly to disk and easy to access. However, this is different when working with Docker as the file system is abstracted away from you and stored inside the container. So while you can get access to those files, it's not the easiest way to get your hands on that data itself. Instead of writing the logs to disk, when you use the production entry point, we change that and we use a tool called FileBeat. FileBeat is a tool that's created by the team at Elastic and it forms part of their overall Elk logging stack made up of three products, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. The images created by the site called Docker Images Repository use FileBeat to push these log details out to the standard out. And from there, it's very simple to use these logs in a variety of different programs, including Docker itself. You could also configure FileBeat to push this data directly into an Elk stack logging setup. So let's take a look at what can be achieved using the default configuration. Okay, so I've loaded up an instance of PowerShell. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stand up some containers to run a Cycle XP instance. I'm gonna show you how you can get real-time logging data out of them. As always, we'll start by setting our license file details into an environment variable. Then I'm gonna move into the 9.3 directory that contains all of my sample Docker Compose files. Next, I'm gonna stand up my XP instance. Using the Docker Compose command, I tell it which Docker Compose file to use. I'm telling it to bring up the container specified in there. And I'm using the dash D flag to run this in disconnected mode. So my PowerShell window here won't be tied to those container instances. So that's completed now. If we run a docker ps-a command, it'll show me all the active containers in my system. And we can see here, we have all the various different XP instances. I have my XP standalone or my CM container. I have my CD container. I have my SQL server, my solar, and all of the various XConnect instances. Now, as I mentioned before, these instances are set up to use FileBeat to push the logs for these various different applications out to the standard out for that container. And that means that Docker can read those and we can get the data directly on the CLI here. So for example, if I wanted to see the logs that are currently being output for my CM instance, I'd use a Docker logs command. We then provide enough of the container ID for it to be uniquely identified. In this case, all we need is a D. If I hit enter, we can see all of the different Sitecore logs being output. Say we wanted to see that in live mode as the logs are being created, we could use a dash F flag 
telling PowerShell here that I want to follow those logs as they're being output. To exit from this mode, we can simply control C and it'll take us back to our command prompt. That's really useful if you want to see the logs from one specific container on your system. But how about if you wanted to view the logs from all the containers, from this entire cycle of architecture in one go? Well, you could do that too. If you do, uh, Docker Compose, tell it the file name again that we used before, our Docker Compose xp.yaml. But this time, instead of up, we're going to use a logs command. And again, we're going to use the follow flag. What this is now going to do is this is going to give us all the logs from all those different containers we saw before. And you can see the first column on the left shows which containers are actually outputting that data for us. So you can see you can get live data from all your logs on screen right in front of you. But what if you're someone who doesn't like to work on the command line? Maybe you prefer a GUI interface to view data like this. Well, there are solutions for that too. If I exit this, I want to show you a program called Portainer, which is a pretty commonly used program for monitoring Docker architectures. And it's super easy to set up. You can get it up and running in just two commands. The first command, I'm going to create a volume. As we discussed in one of the previous videos, volumes allow you to map a folder on your host machine to be used as a folder inside the container. And this is basically where Portainer is going to store all of its data. After we've done that, I'm going to use a docker run command to stand up an instance of Portainer. There's a few parameters here. We're using the run command to tell us to run the container. We're using the dash D flag to tell it to run in disconnected mode. Then we're going to map some ports. We're mapping port 8000 for my host machine to port 8000 inside the container. And we're doing the same with port 9000. Port 9000 on my host to port 9000 in the container. We're specifying a name for the container whether it should be restarted if there's an error occurs and it exits. And then we're going to do the volume mappings. The first one actually maps in a connection to our local Docker engine so that the container can use it internally. The second one maps the data volume we just created. We execute that and all we get is a response of the ID. So start interacting with this. I'm going to load it up in the browser. Localhost 9000, if you remember, was the port we mapped in. And this is the initial configuration window. We just have to set a password for the admin user. Once that's configured, we need to connect to the actual Docker instance we want to monitor. In this case, we're going to manage my local Docker environment running on my host. Remember, we mapped that in as another volume into the container. We hit connect, and it's as easy as that. We now get a fully functional management interface to manage my local Docker instances. I can connect to my local instance and I see I have one stack configured. Each time you run a Docker Compose file consisting of multiple containers, it's created as a stack within Docker. We can browse into there and we can then see each of those containers we saw listed. From here, we can then view the individual log files we just saw before. Here again, it's following the logs as they're being output from the container and you can view them live on screen. There are also some other features you get here which you don't get as cleanly from the CLI. If I go back to this container instance, we can use this stats button here. And this will start to then monitor the resource utilization that this container is making on my machine, refreshing every five seconds currently. So it'll tell you how much memory this container is using, the CPU usage, and the amount of network traffic heading in and out of it. If we scroll down, you can also see all of the active processes within that container. If I go to the end, we can see our W3 WP process. That's the IIS process being used to actually run the CM instance here. If we go back up to the main container listing, you can see we also have a series of control buttons at the top here. From here, you can actually start containers, you can stop containers, restart any that may have exited, or just remove them completely from your system. So you can see this is a really rich admin UI that you can stand up for managing your local Docker containers in just two commands. Really simple to do. So let's take a look at the development entry point now. Don't forget, I said before, the development entry point gives you everything that's part of the production entry point and builds on top of that. The first thing it provides is remote debugging functionality. It installs the Visual Studio remote debugging tool. This means that when you're working locally as a developer, 
you can attach your IDE to the container and debug your application as it's running. We're going to touch on this in a lot more detail in a future video. The other functionality it provides is around deployments, and that's the watch directory.ps1 script. This allows you to mount a directory from your host machine and have that replicated into the container. Any files that you add into that directory are automatically copied into the dubdub root folder where the site's running from. And you can also configure that if you want them copied somewhere else or from a different location using a hash table you pass in at runtime. So let's take a look at some of this in action. Okay, so I've loaded up VS Code. And the first thing we need to do is to edit one of these Docker Compose definitions to map the volumes into the containers we want to include. So I've opened up the container definition for a standard Sitecore XM topology. And I'm going to go and map my source directory into both my CM and CD containers. Here you can see I've now created these volume definitions for both. And what they both say is that I'm going to map the temp directory from my host machine to appear as the SRC directory inside of my container. We save that and we're going to jump over to PowerShell. And now we can go and stand up an architecture based on that definition. Once more, we're using Docker Compose. We specify the YAML file I was just editing. We're going to bring the architecture up and we're going to run it in disconnected mode. Okay, if we run a docker ps a command, now we can see all of the active containers on my system. We can see my SQL container, my solar container, and my CD and CM. Next, I want to actually take a look inside one of these containers. And to do that, you use a docker exec command. What we're saying here is we want to run docker exec we use dash IT to run it in interactive mode, which means we'll have a live connection to the container. We provide enough of the ID for the container to be uniquely identified. In this case, I'm going to connect to my CM instance. So the seven is all I need to provide to identify that container. And finally, we provide the name of the shell we're going to access. When we run that command, we get a live PowerShell connection directly into that container. And we can go and interact with all the files contained in there. If I run an ls command, you can see the source directory that we created through the volume. And we can go and look inside of it, and currently there's nothing stored in there. So I'm going to hop back over to VS Code. I'm going to create a new file with some contents. I'm now going to save that down to the temp folder on my host machine. And we'll call it deployedfile.txt. That's been saved to the temp folder on my host machine, and the volume mapping will now have that file instantly reflected inside the container. So let's hop back to PowerShell. If we now run the ls command once more, we can see the deployed file is present inside the source directory. But as we mentioned before, the watch directory.ps1 script is running and is monitoring this folder. So if I go and access the inet pub and dubdub root directory, which is where the sites run from inside these containers, we can now see that my deployed file has been automatically copied into that location for me. We can also get the content to make sure that it's been copied over with all of its data included. Now, this is a pretty simple example, but it shows how you can push files from your host machine into the container and have those copied into the dubdub root folder. In a future video, I'm going to show how you can build that into your development flow. So you can publish from Visual Studio to a folder on your host, which will then be mapped into the source folder inside of your container. And then the watch directory script will copy those published files straight into the dubdub root folder, ready to be used by Sidecore. Okay, the final thing I want to show you here is how you can actually switch between the development and production entry points. I've hopped back over to VS Code. And if you take a look at this definition for my CD instance, you can see there's a line for the entry point. It calls PowerShell, and then it passes in the actual PowerShell script we want to execute. Inside this tools entry point IIS folder, you'll find both the development and the production PowerShell scripts. So if I want to change from a development workload over to a production workload, all I have to do is change this parameter. And it's as simple as that. Next time I start up this container, it'll execute and action the production workload instead of the development one. Now, I just want to finish here with some tips and tricks to help get you up and running. 
to watch directory scripts will not only copy files and folders from the source directory into the dubdub root folder, it'll also delete any files and folders that you remove from the source directory. So you need to be careful with what you do there, or you could end up removing some files that you don't actually want removed. If you want to connect Sitecore to the Elk stack, well, the Elk stack actually only runs on Linux containers, which means you'll have to run Linux and Windows containers side by side. That is possible with the newer versions of Docker, but you have to enable experimental features to be able to do that. Portainer, which I just showed you, can be integrated into your current Docker Compose setup. So every time you stand up and tear down your architecture, Portainer would come with it. But you may not want that. If you're running multiple different Sitecore architectures, you may want Portainer to be an overall holistic view of logs from all of your containers, in which case you'd want to run it separately. If you want to learn more about any of these topics, you can find out about the IIS service monitor, about how to run Linux and Windows containers side by side, about Filebeat, the Elk stack, and Portainer itself at the different URLs you can see on screen now. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to follow the Learn Cycle hashtag for future videos.